All right, this is being recorded, so anything you say can and will be used to you in a court of law. Um, so we'll be doing that. My name is Buck Woody. I am a senior technical specialist. You can tell that uh, because of the white hair. Um, I've been in computers for a long time, started on mainframes. We didn't actually have computers when I first started. We just shouted zeros and ones at each other. Uh, but uh, I do go back a long way, and it's ironic to see the folks that stole the uh, mainframe away from the mainframe down to PCs, which were saying things like, um, you know, it's not secure, it'll never work, it's not fast enough, uh, they don't know what they're doing. These are the exact same people who now are telling me they will not use the cloud because it's not secure, it's not fast enough, and people don't know what they're doing. So I find those kinds of paradigms ironic, and you're going to find a lot of the things we discuss today, which we'll be moving very quickly through. Uh, my background has been in technology for over 30 years. I currently work at Microsoft. Uh, there will be some product um, claims that I'll make in here, but it's not a marketing session. Um, but the experience that I have are with the Microsoft stack and some open source stuff. So if I mention it, it's not meant to be a product placement. It's meant to tell you how we did it. We're all scientists here, right? So that's the way we do that. Um, normally, I allow questions from the audience while we go. And if you're insistent, I'll do that again. But we have 50 minutes, and I got a lot of stuff to get through. So what I'll do is if you'll give me a few minutes to decompose myself from the uh, back into my bag and get out in the hall, I'll answer questions all day. But I want to be very respectful of the next speaker. Does that make sense? That's all the housekeeping. All right, this plane's going to Chicago. We're going to be talking about big data, big project. If that's not what you were looking to do, there are many other fine sessions. Everybody OK with where we're going? We already have our math victim. So I'm going to have a quiz later. And you've already been given up by your boss, ironic, um, to do some work. So we're going to do that for you. And you can take a joke, right? You can, you're pretty thick skinned. Yeah, I find most math people have to be, is the way it works. OK. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the experience I've had with data science projects. I, I work in, uh, as I mentioned, at Microsoft, and I've ended up doing quite a bit of uh, projects that involve the cloud, and specifically data and the data applications of the cloud. I'll point out a few examples of where I've gone through. I don't have a lot of time to delve into those examples, but I will give you references to everything I do. You can find me at buckwoody.com, spell that carefully, um, and uh, I'll be glad to link in with you. I don't use um, cards anymore, I just use LinkedIn. So feel free to link in with me. I'm promiscuous that way, and we'll be glad to accept it. All right, uh, again, buckwoody.com. We're going to be talking about some concepts, tools, and processes. And what you're going to find is that big data projects are different. Uh, they're not like other projects. And, and you can extrapolate this, by the way, to data science. Uh, big data is our current term du jour. And we always have to have buzzwords for things. And data scientists used to be called researchers or statisticians. But it's OK. We have to title inflate a bit. So that's now a data scientist, and we'll be talking about what that role will be and who you need to look for in your organization if you don't already have that. Let's do a little bit of, uh, we're going to do some math today, so we need to do history to balance that out, right? So um, I'm kind of old. I don't go back to this particular era. But in the 14th century, in the area of Florence, Italy, there's a man named Cosimo, uh, not the guy from Seinfeld. This was older. Um, who actually had a small family and um, began to intermarry into larger families. And you could say that he, was, uh, he had a lot of Facebook friends. He was very well connected. He ran a textiles business, uh, very small. And in fact, he was really a pawn shop. Uh, the banks in Italy at this time uh, were basically pawn shops. That's where you get a loan. You would secure it. He did that on the side along with his textiles and was near the docks. And that was the train stations or the airports of their day. And he was able to uh, interact a great deal with people who had a lot of uh, connections. And so he used that and became uh, very rich and very powerful. In fact, seating four popes, which at the time was the seat of power in Europe. You know them as the Medici family. How many of you have heard of the Medici family? An amazing dynasty. But the thing that I wanted to bring this around to was they were masters at a strategy of data, their connections and their information, and who was doing what and whom they were doing it to. Um, and they were able to take that. And, and literally, it's a fascinating study. Um, one of the guys they made pope was a pirate. 
the guy, he was a pirate who owed them money, and they said, you know, we need somebody we can control. How would you like to be pope? And he said, that sounds awesome. And so they did. That's the kind of power they had. They drove tactics from strategy, and they drove strategy from data. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to show you a framework, but it's difficult to have specific steps. So let's talk about that a little, uh, a little bit. A, a, a data science or a big data project is not like your typical software project. How many of you have been involved in large-scale software projects already? Hopefully every hand goes up. Um, how about uh, large-scale business intelligence projects? Oh my gosh. Did anybody actually use those projects? Um, so that's usually the bane of it. No one ever actually uses it. Um, we're used to these kinds of projects. We're used to online transaction processing systems where the systems are query-based and the user is the expert. So you have to know the structure of the data. You have to know what you're looking for. The brain is on the user. They have to understand. And the data uh, width is pretty limited. It's limited to whatever that system holds. So most of us have been involved in this. Some of us have been involved in BI projects or business information projects. Um, this is being changed, by the way. All of these are being incorporated into a term called analytics, which I like much better. But at any rate, BI solutions are pre-computed. We have to know the kind of data that the users want to get at, and we have to kind of guess what the questions could be. So it's got a bounding to it. Make sense? And here, it's, the model is implicit. You're going to give someone what I call a clicks tool. Uh, a zero-click tool would be data that finds you. You get a, an email that says you're late on your library book, uh, which I just got. I use the library a lot, and I'm forever forgetting to take the books back. So you get an email from the library that says your, your book is due next week. That's a form of intelligence that finds me zero clicks. I didn't do anything. Then there's one click. I got to click a button, and I can see something, a report perhaps that your firm generates or your organization generates and people look at. But then you may have a two-click to where I can change that report slightly. I can pivot it, or I can pick different dates, things like that. Everybody with me so far? And you might even have a three-click, which is a blank screen, some sort of tool, and you teach your people how to use the tool, and then they pull from a, a series of models you've designed, and they know how to, now, you, again, you're getting more and more intelligence within the system. Sometimes that's fine. For a manager who may need to do their own reports, that's acceptable. For a worker, uh, having to know how to do all the reports just adds more time to the day. And for a worker on the line, whatever your line happens to be, whether that's a school or uh, a manufacturing firm, doesn't matter. A line worker wants information that finds them. They really don't want to go discover things. They want to do the work they've been asked to do. Now we come to a data science project. These fall into two big areas, and I'm going to actually come back to this. Uh, and the two areas are this. They're predictive modeling or their pattern detection. So this is kind of new and kind of different. Why is that different? Well, the primary difference is that data context is key. Let me let that sink in a minute. You have to know where it comes from and where it's going to big time. Let me, let me, let's try this. We're all smart folk in here, right? Let's go ahead and try one of these. I'm going to give you a range of temperatures. Let's say I give you a week's worth of temperature data, and you tell me if it will snow tomorrow or not, right? We could do a predictive model from that, could we not? If we knew it was 32, 31, 30, uh, 38, 42, we could say, well, the pattern seems to show, and we, we predict whether it's going to snow or not. Now let me add some more information to the mix. Let me give you a month's worth of temperature and precipitation data. That's much more uh, indicative, isn't it? It's a better model. Now let me explain to you that you're living in Miami, OK? The one vector that you have there is now throws out almost all the other day. It rarely snows in Miami. I live in Tampa, Florida, and it's currently 84 degrees outside right now. Just thought I would toss that in for you. Um, the, the other part is the, is the post information, the data context is key. As the captain comes on and says, I uh, want you to know we're flying at 30,000 feet. We're doing about 700 miles an hour. We are making great time, but we're headed the wrong way. Right, So the context of how you use the data is as important as where you get it from. This is slightly different. In most of our systems, OLTP certainly, and BI often, the context is assumed. 
if I have a model and I'm letting my customers pull it down and look at that data and they're making decisions and reports off of that data, they're assuming that it fits the context. Yes, yes, but does it? That's the question. And so your first part of the whole data science uh, experiment here it's not just that the person knows stats. I've heard a data scientist referred to as a statistician that knows a lot about software or a software person that knows a lot about statistics. And that's probably true. It's in that mix somewhere. But the point is, it's more than that. You need the domain knowledge of where you're looking. And we're going to talk about where you're looking in just a minute. Any questions? OK. I, I want to briefly refer to why I'm telling you what I'm telling you. These are some of the projects we've done that are sort of marquees uh, around a data science environment. I don't have time, unfortunately, due to our time constraints today to go into each of these. But there is a slideshow from CIO.com. These are ones we've been involved with, which include both Microsoft and open source software. So it's not, a, again, not a product placement. This is the basis of what I've done. When we did the Halo launch with 343, they wanted to evaluate how well the gamers were doing, and they wanted to adapt the game real time. So they had to take in an incredible amount of game player telemetry, uh, cheating, rewards, motivation. These were all kinds of things. But most importantly, instrumentation. They wanted to see how well the system was performing because that will kill you if you're going out with a commercial product and it doesn't perform well. Um, some of the others, uh, Barcelona was interesting and in Barcelona, Spain, they actually have a big data project and what it does is allows you as a citizen to go in, uh, do some things and explain your interests and so on. It does heuristics around a lot of big data and builds a portal just for you. So you have an individualized government experience based on who you are and where the data comes from and so on. Kind of an innovative use, not something we'd think about in big data. Uh, we've got Chris Hansen, or CHR Hansen, excuse me, um, that also uh, involve things like genetics and all kinds of other traditional kinds of big data stuff. But anyway, I want just to mention briefly um, the things that we've done so you know where the background is coming from. And again, you can read that more. Data science can be boiled down to this sentence in my mind. I teach at the University of Washington, and on my faculty bio page, it says, all computing is just rearranging data. And I still believe that to be true. Um, I have a universal computing uh, paradigm as well. It's a large-scale database, and it has an arrow that goes to Excel. Pretty much, if you can do that, that's, that's computer science in a box there. Um, appropriate data. Now, this is pregnant with meaning, so I'm going to decompose this a bit. With scientific analysis can lead to better strategic and tactical decisions. Let's break this down. Appropriate data. What's appropriate data? Hmm. Well, we think more data, right? Obviously, more data points leads to uh, better decisions, correct? And you've always heard uh, data beats decisions. If I have a lot of information about a thing, theoretically, I can predict its behavior down to the nth. It was a Foghorn Leghorn cartoon I saw one time. Anybody know who Foghorn Leghorn is? Come on, raise your hand. You grew up on Saturday cartoons just like me. All right, so he's a big, he's a big rooster. And uh, he, he would always get uh, trapped into doing things by the Widder Johnson, as a widow chicken who real thin. And she had this little kid that was a nerd, the big head and a real tiny body. You know what I'm talking about? He, he had big glasses, right? So uh, the Foghorn Leghorn's trying to get him to play baseball and stuff. He's clueless. So he tries, all right, let's try hide and seek. So he starts to play hide and seek with the little egghead kid. And the egghead kid never talks in the cartoon, right? Um, so he says, you stand here, and you count, and then I'm going to go run hide, and you find me. That's the game. And the kid looking at him like, all right, whatever. So Foghorn Leghorn takes off the kid's counting. He gets in a taxi. He flies an airplane. He takes a boat to China. He goes over to India. He hides behind a tree. The kid finishes counting, looks around, takes out a pad and pencil, and begins to do calculations. After he does the calculations, he takes three steps forward, two steps to the right, takes out a shovel, pulls in the ground, and up pops Foghorn Leghorn, who's aghast. How did this happen? And the kid just shows him the paper, right? That's data science. Um, you know exactly what you need to know. But what's appropriate data? How many of us know that in math, any two points can be joined by a line? Any three points can be joined by a plane, right? So that would tell you right there, that simple math axiom, that if you put enough data on anything, you can make it say anything you want. More data is not better. The appropriate data is better. 
Yes, more data from more sources that has a corollary effect. Ooh, that's the tough part. So the second skill of a data scientist, not just knowing stats or software, but also knowing not just the domain knowledge, but knowing the appropriate data to grab. That's huge. That's huge. That's also huge in business intelligence, but it's even bigger in big data because we're going to get data from lots of sources. Scientific analysis, that's super important. There is some art to this still, always will be. Um, but what we've found in our projects and dealing with customers is that you need a rigorous scientific process that can be tested. How many of you know what holdout data is inside statistics? Holdout data is where you take data from a model uh, that you already, uh, you already know. You've got the attributes and you've got the predictor, which is the target that you want to know. And what you do is then you take your model and you run it over that data. The problem is if you build a model from data, it will always work because you built it from that data. So when you go back and say, well, let's test it on the historical data and see if it works. Well, if 1 plus 1 equals 2 in my sample data, 1 plus 1 will equal 2 when I run that test in my sample data, right? So you take some of that data and you hold it out. You don't include it in the training set for your machine learning. You let the system run across it, and then you try it on the holdout data. And there's a sweet spot uh, that we find that that's useful for. Now, it can lead uh, there is no exact. Uh, it's not, unfortunately, a foghorn leghorn cartoon. You're not going to pop up the, the prize just by writing out some math. Um, there's limits to how much this goes. It's amazing limits, uh, but it is uh, interesting stuff. All right, strategic and tactical. Strategy should always drive tactics, not the other way around. Uh, everybody understand the difference. Strategic is long-term and overarching goals, and tactics are what you do to get you to those goals. If you're not familiar with strategics and uh, tactics, um, you might want to look up the OODA, O-O-D-A loop uh, that was put forth uh, from West Point years and years ago. It's been used in business, OODA loop, and it will explain some things about how you implement tactics based on strategy. Questions here. So the first thing we have to do is educate the company, the organization, in what they're doing. So this is the first phase we found inside a data science project, and it's not just uh, what they can do. I, I bought this book uh, right before I got on the plane for a little light reading, and I love it. I highly recommend it. It's got math in it. It's not super nasty math, but it's got math in it. Um, if you're a manager, I still think you should read it. It's really good. You should understand what your data science team is doing, and we'll come around to what a data science team looks like, at least in our experience, okay? Uh, data science for business, uh, not from me. They don't mention Microsoft, um, uh, but I just think it's really well done. I love the book. I've been reading it over and over since I read it on the plane. Uh, data science for me. I'll leave that up there for a second. If you want to take a picture or something, knock yourself out. All right. Um, okay. That was the pitch for Amazon.com, I suppose, not me. Um, you, you've got a couple of things that you're going to educate your folk on. The first phase of education, the, the first thing you do is you explain to them, this is not a typical software project. The second thing you need to explain to your leadership is, we have two kinds of things we can tell you. We can predict things, and, we, and that's a sort of an if something will happen or when something will happen. Um, or you can do descriptive things, which is what that thing looks like or who that thing looks like. Uh, you've dealt with this before. When you've gone to Amazon.com, people who bought this book also bought this book. And the what, uh, if you like this book, you'll love that book, right? And it seems um, trivial, but Bing, Google, and others um, apply a, approximately 12 artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms to every query you type. Do you know that? Every query you type comes back with that. Um, interesting stuff. These are the two kinds of things you can do, and you can answer a new set of questions. Now, why do we start here? Well, we start here because we're going to have to go start getting data uh, for these things. Um, and you're going to do either supervised learning where you have some data on the target that you're going for and then you want to do predictive model, or you have unsupervised learning, which is we need to detect patterns. Both can be predictive or descriptive. Questions here? I know we're going quick. Uh, and I've got blogs on these things and so on, so we'll go from there. The next phase is the data identification. You will have internal data and you will have external data that you can get. The third qualification in my mind of a good data scientist is someone who knows the sources of data they can get and the context of that data. Great place to look for data is what? Internal, obviously, but then external. What's a great place to look for data? Shout it out. Not all at once. Twitter, Twitter interesting, good. Sensors, good. Um, government, 
great place to look for data. They give you lots of data for free, not just our government, but others. Um, your public library, if you go to their website, and if you click to the left on the research little indicator, they'll be somewhere. Uh, they're in every public library, even my tiny one in Safety Harbor, Florida, has an amazing, rich set of data sets. Uh, info chimps, other kinds of places. How many of you think Mark Zuckerberg just spent multiple billions of dollars for an IM app? How many of you, see that in the news? How many of you think he spent it for the, he didn't spend it for the IM app, he spent it for the data. When you're not the customer, you're the product. A lot of people forget that. Um, but there's an incredible amount of rich data that people just have absolutely no problem putting on the interwebs. Uh, happy anniversary, Diane and John. Well, guess what? Now everybody knows your anniversary date. Uh, would you like to go to your class reunion? Now I know where you went to college, right? Lots of data that you're not sharing that's shared anyway. So you want to know, your data scientist wants to know, how does that inflection point of that data affect the decisions we could make? Would you like to know more about your donor's habits. Everybody should go like this. This is just a, actually just testing to see if you're awake. Okay, um, yeah, you'd like to know that. Where can you get that data? That's the question. That's the big question. No, you can't probably link in with Bill Gates. I, I have tried, although I think he's probably seen some of my presentations and has um, uh, you know, rejected me outright. All right, um, you also have to be careful with combining data. The data scientist needs to understand correlation and causation. Um, each and every morning I get up and pretty much the first thing I do once I can visibly see is start the coffee pot because I drink a lot of coffee. Um, which Starbucks, as you heard in the last session, is extremely happy about. I, I am one of their big data sets, it turns out. Um, but I drink coffee every morning and every morning, in Florida at least, the sun comes up, I've noticed. And so obviously my drinking coffee is now a moral obligation to keep the sun coming up, right? So that's a correlation, that is not a correlation uh, to a causation. I don't cause any kind of sunrise because I drink coffee. Now I do in the house because if I don't get coffee, it gets pretty ugly in there. But you need to make sure that the, this basic error is avoided. And the more numbers you put around it and the more Excel graphs you make, the more this is risky to happen. I've seen it. If you throw enough equations and Excel graphs at things, managers will believe you. So you need to be extraordinarily careful. Um, it's your credibility online. Questions here in data identification? Um, then you gotta map those data to the question. We need to treat data like an asset. I always say people are our greatest asset. People are not assets, people are people. Assets are things like computers and desks and chairs, but we don't treat data like that. Let me ask you a question. Are people the most important thing in our company? People's the most important thing in our company. Is that true? Hmm. Bill Gates left Microsoft a few years ago. You probably heard something about that. Microsoft is still here, doing quite well. So apparently the most important person at Microsoft left and the company continued. However, if all of the data, everything about me and the fact you owe money to me and the fact that I owe money to you and the fact that I work at Microsoft and all of our building code entries and our software repositories, if all of that data disappeared and there were no backups and all of that literally went away, think about this if you will. By the way, I've seen this happen, uh, not at Microsoft, but at small companies, I've seen their data be completely wiped out. The company's gone. If we had no idea who we owed, if we had no idea who owed us or who worked anywhere or how to get into a building, we couldn't continue. What's the best asset in a company? Your data, right? So we need to start treating data uh, like an asset. And what do we do with assets? We invest in them. We buy them uh, to get more. How many of you buy data? Don't raise your hand. How many of you buy data? And if you went to your boss and said, we need to buy some data. I have 90% uh, of the variables I need to get the target, but I need 10% more. It's gonna cost us $150,000 a download. What would your boss tell you? I mean, after they finish laughing, <laughs> right? We don't treat data like an asset. It's your job to try and make that important. You can do that by doing some question mapping. You mentioned earlier uh, instrumentation monitoring. We actually have this going on inside Windows Azure right now to where the smart grid of power uh, actually loads up every single power outlet as it has a TCP IP address and is loading real time back into a data store which is being monitored by the company. In Florida, I'm allowed to tell the power company, you may adjust the power you send to my house. 
They watch my house and they see when the air conditioner comes on and goes off and they see when I use hot water and when I don't and if I have solar or not and they adjust my power accordingly and they give me a break on my bill. Real-time monitoring. This is incredibly big data. Now, would that be useful to you? I don't know. If you knew that the power was off at your largest donor's house every summer, would that be information that might be interesting? Okay. Uh, in the fourth phase, we do a technologies selection, and this is where I'll get a little Microsoft-y in just a moment, and again, you can just extrapolate out to whatever your favorite software vendor is, knock yourself out. I'm just gonna tell you what we did, but it involves three phases, at least in my mind. Um, data management, and again, relational, non-relational, analytical, and I wanna spend some time in a moment on streaming. We'll talk about streaming data. And then data enrichment, where we discover data that we have and need, we combine it, and then we refine it into an actionable model. And then we go to insight. We start with self-service, we move to collaboration, corporate apps, and then we even push out to devices. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the data flow. One thing I want to address here is that there's no such thing as data science in a box yet. Remember back in the 80s when BI came out and you still needed a person. You still needed a lady or a gentleman that was really good at business intelligence and they set up in a, a, a special group and they got direct access to management and they would create pretty graphs and charts and KPIs and they would bring them out and they would display them like Moses from the mountain, right? On the tablets, not, well not those kind of tablets, these were actually stone tablets in my day. Um, but they would show these things around and they'd say, here look, here's the data, you know, look at this. And then they said at that time, there will never be BI in a box. Well, I beg to differ. With many software packages, Microsoft included, you throw a relational database up, you throw an OLAP cube on top of it, you open up SharePoint or some other tool or, or Excel, the world's database, and you um, do some slicing and dicing. And now there really is BI in a box. And, and years ago, it was unactionable. You had to be super careful. Now it's pretty reliable. I mean, I see people doing this stuff every day. There is BI in a box. Will there be data science in a box? I believe so. Um, I'm not quite to Ray Kurzweil's prediction that within 30 years we'll have sentient computers, because I don't even think we have sentient people sometimes, but uh, I've seen, I've, I, we need you know, less smartphones and more smart people in my mind, but um, I believe it's coming. I believe we'll get to a point to where the predictive uh, analytics will get to such a point to where you can do this. Questions here? All right, let me just go over our stack again. This is just what we did in the, in the examples I showed you earlier. Extrapolate to your software package, all right? That's fine. Um, you can't see this, unfortunately, because of the blue but uh, on this projector, but at any rate, it says in line, in line, and we have a series of software products that will allow you to look at the data as it goes by. So in some cases, specifically the power stations, cases, they didn't really want to store and analyze the data later. They wanted to do something about it now. And so you can stream data. That means you can put a layer in between the data source and it's uh, where it's going. Like when somebody enters data and it goes past, look at it and the machine's uh, doing data and it's coming past, look at it. I was working with one manufacturing firm and, and I said, why do you, you know, this is the typical data science project, why are you doing what you're doing? Well, we need to get this data set over here. And I'm like, okay, what are you gonna do with it there? Well, we're gonna put it in Excel, okay? And then what are you gonna do? Well, then we're gonna look at it. You're gonna look at 58,000 rows of Excel data at a time, yes. What are you looking for? Well, we're looking to see if it says 42. <laughs> ah, and what do you do if it says 42? Oh, we turn the power down to that machine. Okay, how about this? How about when it gets to 42, I turn the power down? So, right, it's the Bruce Lee thing of uh, the best way to fight is not to fight. We didn't collect the data. There was no big data problem. There was a velocity problem. Just coming too fast. They were looking at it later and then making models to say at three o'clock, turn the machine down. Uh, in fact, they could just do that when needed. Does that make sense? Everybody with me there? So sometimes you do not need to store the data. That's my bigger point. Questions on that point? And Twitter analysis, yes, sir. Have you seen anybody use that for compliance? So a lot of times people look backwards. Are there any examples? So examples, the question was, are, have I seen anybody use this for compliance? And yes, the credit card companies do it all the time. They also store it, so they will look at it real time, but they'll also store it. And um, it was interesting to me, I recently moved from Seattle to Florida in the winter with my wife, two cats, a pickup truck, and a large U-Haul trailer. 
So you can question my knowledge and wisdom right now because I was when I got caught in the ice storm in um, uh, Portland and wrecked the truck. And don't get me started. It was a long story. It's very painful. The cats were involved. It's, a, it's just very sad. So uh, I, I called a friend of mine who actually works in the credit card monitoring agency. And I'm like, you know, I just drove from Seattle to Florida spending, you know, credit card things at small Joe's Crab Shacks and gas stations and all, how did they, why did I not get a, a, a thing going, we monitored you, and he said, oh, two weeks before you rented a U-Haul. And you paid 713 and 98 cents for it, and that means you're going cross country. So, yeah, we just extrapolated from that. So they do that real time, yeah, great question. Okay, now sometimes you do need to ingress the data, so you gotta figure out how to do it. These are the tools, I'm not gonna spend time uh, and be too Microsoft-centric, just letting you know that we stayed within the Microsoft stack, sort of. Um, Microsoft is now using Linux up in Azure. Uh, we use Hadoop, we use Scoop, um, we use lots of Apache things. Um, we're now, this is not your father's Microsoft, that's all this shows, okay? So we did use these other technologies as they come to play. Um, and then we just had straight APIs where we would actually write code on top of systems that don't have an ingress or uh, an, an, an egress, and we just suck the data out real time as it came by and put in these systems. And then you need to store it and process it. Now this is a different phase than what we used to have in OLAP. I'll show you that in just a minute. So we've got inline, which we'll ignore for the moment, ingress, store, and process. We used to do that with OLTP and OLAP. Fairly straightforward. You do this today, we store and process the data, and we have lots of ways to do that. Um, the different colors there indicate different um, products that we use to do that. But this is the phase that's different. It's usually combined with the phase I'll show you in a moment in BI that's broken out in data science. In data science, sometimes we're looking for an answer. We're looking for 42, right? So you've got to know the questions you're trying to do. And in fact, sometimes what you're doing, and I'll show this in a moment, is you're breaking the big rocks into little rocks. You want to take the large amounts of data and then break that into sort of a piece that the OLAP system can swallow so you can do historical or exploratory analysis. And then finally, presenting and navigating. You'll notice there's more products in presenting and navigating than there is anywhere else within our stack. Well, for one thing, you don't need that many products to actually store data, storage is storage, but you do need different ways to look at it, and that's okay. And this is the view, the lens, that you should take a look at and what we worked with in our data science projects at our clients. The lens was you want lots of ways to look at the data. It's okay. It's okay to have a lot of uh, windows, sorry for that reference, um, uh -huh. um, sorry, the, the windows into the same frame of data. It's okay to do that. Do not try and force a visualization tool down your users' throats. There is a reason that we made a uh, Hadoop uh, connector into Excel. God help us all. Um, we all know that Excel runs the world, um, and by the way, we're completely immune to the fact uh, that uh, you know, everybody stores all of their actionable data in Excel. We would never do that at Microsoft, um, just so you know. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the world runs on Excel. I firmly believe that when the universe is over, there will be a small box in the back that's running Excel that was running the whole thing in a macro. Um, but the, the way to visualize data is huge, and sometimes starting with the data visualization um, is the right way to go. Uh, visualizations can say something that nothing else can. Here's a great scatter plot, and you probably intuitively understand uh, the meaning of it, but um, it can be useful to start with the visualization tool. You might want to start your data science project during the education phase by asking people one simple question. How do you look at data? Um, if it's, if, if it's a, a spreadsheet, or if it's a small database, or if it's a tool they found on the web, or whatever it is, for one thing, this might tell you you've got a bunch of security holes, um, so that'd be great to find out. But ask people how they look at data, and then meet them where they are. Uh, those of you that raised your hands that had done a BI project that no one ever actually used, which I've done tons of those, um, the reason they didn't use them was I didn't meet them where they were. And when I meet people where they are, they use my stuff. A friend of mine uh, bought a boat in Florida, and he bought, like, the first day he got the boat, he went out and found just, like, like the best garden hose he could find and all these cleaning things and these big, long brushes on the end of sticks. He spent, like, three hours in the boat store getting all this stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? 
He says, you have to clean a boat from the salt water or it'll mess it up. And he said, it's hard to do. When you own a boat, you're two hours out on the water and then you're six hours cleaning it. And he said, I have found one thing in my short existence is that if something's easy, you'll do it. And if something is hard, you won't. If you make your users learn another paradigm, they won't use it because they're trying to get their job done every day. So don't. Meet them where they are. That's OK. Questions here on the visualization stuff? All right, this is a huge one. This phase, uh, and I'm going to bring all these phases back up for you at the end if you are taking notes. Um, you've got lots of systems involved in a data science project, a ton, uh, just an absolute ton, more than you've got in anything else. Even if you pick a single stack like ours, you're still going to end up with a lot of products. And you've got three big pieces. You've got the processes, which how the data moves from one place to the other, who has to sign off on something, what regulatory requirements cover this or that. You've got these processes. Then you've got operating systems, Linux and Windows and uh, you know, Windows, oh my. I mean, you've got all these different operating systems that have different ways to look at what they're doing. And then you've got platforms, Hadoop and SQL Server and Oracle and whatever you happen to have. All of these things have instrumentation built into them. You can get metrics out of them. You can see how long a query took to run. You can see how long it took data to insert. You could see uh, from here, uh, it takes a week for me to wait for you to get back from vacation to sign off on the paper that says I'm allowed to look at that data. You can metric all that stuff. You need to do that, we found, because this is back to the, we're rocketing back to the 70s and 80s in the mainframes. It's a sort of batch processing mentality again. How many of you remember batch processing? Just me, come on, raise your hands, all right. Um, uh, you need to be able to figure out how to interpret all the systems together and tune them so that you get data and you can predict when you'll have the answer. Do you remember Deep Thought from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? It took millions of years to, or hundreds of thousands of years to figure out the answer to life, the universe, and everything, and it's 42, by the way. Then they said, well, what does that mean? They said, well, you didn't say what was the question. So that'll take another 100,000 years to compute, right? So you need to figure out your 100,000 years because people are going to want to know. And to do that, um, I recommend one of your first data science projects is to make one of these. All of these have disparate data. They have a lot of data. They have corollary data. They need data. Perfect example. So your data science team should probably start out with doing data science on the data science project. They'll like that too because it's recursive and they can do it in R. Okay, questions here on instrumentation. This was one of the biggest bugaboos, guys, that, I've, that I ran to in the projects that I worked on was actually getting into uh, the instrumentation phase. Okay, then we move to implementation. This one's huge. So let's talk a, a, a little bit about um, this phase here because I wanna talk about two things in this part. The first is where does the data start and where does it go? Um, it's going to start and come into whatever analytics system you create. That's, that's your goal, and you think you're done at that point. In fact, you need to coordinate with the downstream stakeholders because there will be a visualization or an answer that goes to a set of people. And we think of this. As data scientists, we think of this. I'm going to get you 42, and I'm going to show you 42, and I'll put it in red. That's a visualization for me, red or green, right? That's my visualization methodology. I'm not a designer. I'm a geek, so I don't know anything about colors and all that. But red means bad, and green means good. So I would say 42, that's good, right? And there you go, that's green. Um, so I'll do that for you, and that's usually where we stop, but that's not where it should stop. You may want to take the big rocks and make little rocks out of them so that your OLAP systems or OLTP systems, for that matter, can reconsume the data. So once I've done the combinatorial math on it, um, I, I do it that way. And then uh, finally, it may actually trigger actions like our 42 for the machine that turns the machine down. Um, we have to be super careful here. Your data science team needs to be fairly small. We found that if it was institutionalized to the BI team, it didn't work. Um, it was too hard to break out of patterns we already have. Let's do a math quiz you want. I want you to give me a formula. Okay, you're looking for a formula. We, we would call that a model, which is what a mathematician would call it. I'll give you some numbers and a set. You're going to give me a function formula model that describes a predictive way to say the next number. Got me? All right, here we go. Two. You can play along if you want, but don't tell him the answer. I don't want him cheating. Four. Six. Eight. 10, function, two, four, six, eight, 10. N plus two, how many of you agree? 
I think it's a pretty good model. Let me add some data to the set. Let me give you some entropy. 13. Oh, crap. My model's broke. What's another model for that? It's really hard. You know the answer, so you don't get to say. I spoke with the CIO of the Gates Foundation yesterday, and I told him the, I told him the answer. It's uh, n is greater than n. It's just bigger. Next number is bigger. Isn't that simple? I felt so bad when I learned that. By the way, I took the same test and I failed it. Um, I, I could not get out of the pattern. N plus two, 13? Okay, yeah, I need more data because that way I can see if it's N plus two to the nth or something, right? So I'm looking for it and it's like, no, the next one's bigger than that one, right? So we cannot not see patterns. So I would recommend that your data science team not be your current BI team. Does that mean they can't be involved? No, they can be involved, but I don't recommend that they do. And I'm sorry that, uh, that is, what I, what I would say is to make sure nobody's feelings are hurt or whatever, appoint a special advisor or whatever, and then make sure you work with those people as your downstreams or even your upstreams, they will be a data source. A lot of times our OLTP systems don't record historical data that's put in a data warehouse or what I call a data trough. Um, for everybody to feed at, and then we chunk that down into our BI systems, you'll need those people as a data source. I would say leave them alone and let them incorporate into your project. Um, you want, might want to do some business intelligence across your own HR systems to find people who have a business degree, like me, but have worked in technology for 30 years. That's going to be somebody and who has a, a fairly heavy math bent. Um, so you could look at that. And we have a, a tool at Microsoft where we self-identify. It's called Doctor Who. I know, right? Um, it, we self-identify and I say, I know about, and it goes into a big database and someone can type in, I need a guy that knows Hadoop to help me with this thing. Now, of course, that means I'm going to get more work to do. So how often I put information in that tool um, is questionable. But the point is that um, you may want to do some BI across your own, or data science, across your own HR systems. Google does this quite a bit. They actually spend a great deal of time. They've hired some quants, people from Wall Street, into their HR systems. Uh, so they can find out things like, did we hire the right people? Did we miss somebody? And I bet a couple of them right now over at Facebook uh, after the guy with WhatsApp uh, applied to work there and was told, nah, you're not a right fit. And then they had to buy his app for $16 billion later. Uh, there's somebody in HR going, oh, could have had a V8. Um, so there we go. All right, questions here on the implementation side? Let's delve a little bit into this. We're going to combine our data, and there are different people that do that. Your data scientists are going to do your advanced analytics. There's not a lot of that that should be done. You can't have a, a new strategy every day. That's dumb. Um, so your, your strategies should be extrapolated out further. So there are going to be fewer of those people who are better at what they do for a longer time frame. They are not your implementation people. And the danger is going to be to use those people for other things. Don't do it. Um, I see that happen all the time. Then you've got your current BI professionals. Leave them alone. They take data from the petabytes to the terabytes. Let them do their job. They're good at it. And then you've got your gigabytes that you can pull down to your BAs or whatever the equivalent is uh, at your organization for a BA, maybe a manager. I've seen a lot of times the BAs are actually the managers um, who need to do actionable, tactical responses on things. Now, we all like to think we make strategic decisions, but we don't. Um, most of the stuff we do is confined to a particular domain or sphere. And so don't be um, oversensitive about your title. Do your job, do it well, all work is honorable. All right, questions here? Okay, you guys are quiet. Of course, I told you no questions, and then I said, do you want questions? I just want to see how you deal with conflict in your, in your life. Um, the thing about data science is interesting, and this is where we're towards the end here, um, is the looping function. You will loop this. I mean, you see this in other paradigms, but it is big time here. You need to test your models. You need holdout data. You need to test and see if those models work. Um, this is important. If it is strategic, you're turning the company. I had a large uh, manufacturer of airplanes that works nearby uh, tell me, um, I, look, I don't need another stupid exploratory tool. I'm a manager. I'm busy. I don't want to explore things. I need to know. i got a pile of aluminum outside. Is it more profitable for me to make hubcaps or airplane wings? That's what I need to know, right? So you need to make sure that because you're making big strategic decisions, you're constantly refining your models. 
you're constantly refining your models. Let me leave you with this statement on this part of the, of the day. Um, statistics, and maybe extrapolate out to data science, is about reducing uncertainty. It's not an answer. It's about reducing uncertainty. Three statisticians go hunting. They're out in the field, and they're not good at hunting. They're geeks like me. They don't know anything about outside or sports or women or anything like that, right? We're just not good at that. And so they're out hunting. They have a gun. They barely know which end shoots, right? But they know they need to get out more. So they're out rabbit hunting. And a rabbit darts from the hedge, and the first statistician just fires the gun. No aiming, just fires the gun. And it hits 100 yards in front of the rabbit, like nowhere close to the rabbit. And so the rabbit turns and darts the other way. And the other statistician shoots where the rabbit used to be. And the rabbit's long gone. So he shoots like 100 yards behind him. And the middle statistician goes, we got him. OK. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, you will want to refine your data. And you will want to keep in, in uh, mind that you want to come from the entire uh, full analytic spectrum. Um, here is the steps again. How are we doing on time management? Did I hit it to the second? Three minutes? That's too long, they could ask a question. Let me blather on a bit. Um, no, seriously, if you do have a question, this is the time. Uh, the, the, the phases we found, I, I, I numbered them, and I took the numbers off, and then I put them back, and I took the numbers off. This is the order that worked for me and the teams I've worked on in the data science and big data projects I've worked on. However, you may find something a little different. That's fine with me, but I'll leave this up for just a moment. But the point is, you educate what's possible, you identify what you have and what you need. You make an investment in data. You map the questions to the data, and then you buy data you don't have, or you go get data you don't have. And by the way, you always buy data because you're paying someone to get it, even if it's free data. Somebody's got to clean it, find it, get it, and so on. In fact, it's a great interview question for a data scientist. They come in, and they want me to ask them all kinds of questions about stats or Fourier transforms or Gaussian distributions, and I tell them, where's the best way to find out data that I need. What do you, what's your methodology? What do you do to find data you don't have? And I get a lot of blank stares. And that's scary. OK. Um, then you select your technologies. After you have this stuff, then figure out the technology is easy. It, it really is. Pick a stack, go with it. It really is straightforward. But map what you need before you map the technology. Don't, uh, my grandmother was from South Carolina, and um, my people are all from New Orleans. It's Fat Tuesday, by the way. Les les bon ton roulé, for those of you in here uh, that, that share my proclivity. Um, but anyway, uh, my grandma used to start out with a cast iron skillet, and we'd come over, and she'd say, what do you want me to put in this lard? Um, because you basically fry everything in South Carolina. And it was, by the way, it was awesome. I mean, you know, you wouldn't think, but we have lard and everything. Um, but don't start with the lard. Uh, start with uh, what's our question and what's going to do that best. Don't forget to make an instrumentation plan before you get started. Because somebody's going to invariably come to you and say, I am paying your salary. So tell me, when are we going to get an answer out of this big new shiny? Bring the machine that goes bing. And does it, when am I going to get an answer from that? And you go, we really don't know. It's not a great way to start. Um, and then implement, and then loop it. Questions on what I've covered? Here's the stuff from Microsoft. I have to put this up here because Bill Gates still pays me. And I'd like that to continue. I really need gainful employment. Did I mention I wrecked my truck with some cats? My wife is speaking to me now, so that's good. Uh, but I have expenses, y'all, so take a look at the links. OK, any questions? Seriously, we've got a couple minutes left. All right, if you do have any questions or things you'd like to chat over, I'll be here today and tomorrow. Um, there is food. You got goodie bags. If you didn't get a goodie bag, see the people downstairs said, Buck told me you'd give me a goodie bag. It's just got crackers and stuff in it. Don't get excited, but it, it's a goodie bag. Get what's free. All right, guys, thank you very much for your time. Have a great day.